When I was eight years old, my mom took me to a party. My grandfather's friend was visiting from Japan, and she wanted me to meet her. But before we went inside, my mom warned me, Ari, grandpa's friend is burned. Please, don't mention her scars. And I was only eight, so I, I asked my mom what happened to her, and she told me she was burned by the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. I said, Mom, don't you think that's strange? Grandpa's friend survived Hiroshima, and Pop-Pop dropped the bomb on her. Pop-Pop was what we called my other grandfather, Jacob Beezer. He was the only man in the world to fly on both planes that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In America, we were taught that the bombs were a good thing, that they saved lives and ended the war quickly, and that the crewmen were heroes. They made a movie about it in the 80s, and Billy Crystal played my grandfather. Wasn't I supposed to be proud? Well, March 10th, 2011, I actually won a grant that morning to go to Japan and write a book about Jacob Beezer, the Japanese lady, and the strange family coincidence. And I was on my way home from celebrating, and it was already March 11th in Japan. The Great East Japan earthquake had struck and caused a tsunami that washed up the Tohoku coast and inundated some towns with up to 30 meters of water. And the news kept unfolding, and we found out that there was a, a nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. And day after day, as the news unfolded and it kept getting worse, I, I never canceled my plans to come. And by that summer, I was in Japan, ready for the atomic bomb anniversaries. And I met the Japanese lady's family and asked them if they would work with me and help me write this book. And they said, no. If you want to write a book about the atomic bomb of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and you want to understand, you have to meet survivors. We'll be your friends privately, but we can't work with you publicly. You have to meet as many survivors as you can if you want to understand. So ever since then, I've been on a journey to meet these survivors of the atomic bomb, or hibakusha as they're called in Japanese, and trying to meet as many as I can since. That same summer, I was introduced to the artist Shinpei Takeda. He said he knew the perfect people for me to meet. One of them was Yuji Sasaki, Sadako Sasaki's nephew. Sadako was the girl who folded a thousand paper cranes to fulfill the Japanese legend that says, doing so gets you a wish. Her wish was to cure her leukemia that she got from the bomb's radiation. But she passed away. Her message of hope lives, and children all over the world today are folding paper cranes for peace because of her. And when I told Yuji what I was doing and what I wanted to understand, he caught this idea and he ran into a back room. And he came out a few seconds later with a little plastic box. And he opened the box, and inside was this tiny little paper crane and a tiny paper triangle. And he told me that that was the last paper crane his aunt ever folded. And the triangle was the crane that she didn't finish. And then he told me to open my hand, and he took out the crane, and he put it in the center of my palm. It's a tiny, isn't it? In 2010, I met the grandson of President Truman, the grandson of the president who dropped the atomic bomb. And I did the same thing for him that I'm doing for you, and I asked him the same question I'm about to ask you. Will you work with us to send a message of peace? And I was only 23 at the time. I didn't know what I could do to help, but I knew why I needed to try. If we could come together as Japanese and Americans, as former enemies and descendants of these involved people with the history, then it would be an example to the world of the positive changes that are possible. I was told that there are two types of peace activities. There's negative peace and there's positive peace. Negative peace isn't a bad thing. It just means that we will achieve peace through the absence of something. Like, if we get rid of landmines or nuclear weapons or guns, then we'll achieve peace. Positive peace is a little different. It just means that people can come together and build better relationships. We can do that. Sure, we can demand that our governments have high-level discussions to eliminate the weapons of war, but we can come together as ordinary people from opposite ends of a conflict and build better relationships ourselves. That night that I met Yuji, 
Shinpei introduced me to a few more people. They were volunteers working in the Tohoku cities of Ofunato and Rikas and Takata with a group called All Hands Volunteers. Shinpei thought that after spending some time trying to understand the atomic bombs, the disaster, it would be good for me to go up to an ongoing disaster and help in the recovery efforts. 80% of Rikas and Takata was washed away. And on a coastline where there used to be 70,000 trees, there was only one left standing. All Hands was doing a lot of different work. They were doing so many kinds of projects, mudding houses, cleaning up fish factories, and cleaning photographs. I was helping with the photo cleaning project. And it was like, people were, we found a lot of photographs in the debris, and people were bringing in photographs for us to clean. But it was something I became very passionate about. It wasn't the most popular project on the, of all the different kinds of work that you could do. It wasn't the most popular one, but it was like giving back a piece of the memory of people's lives before everything was washed away. And I'm a photographer. I was so I understood the value of pictures. But I never told any of the local people what I was actually doing in Japan. I didn't want my family's story to interfere with their recovery. But I told some of the volunteers. And to my surprise, I wasn't the only one there with a connection to the atomic bombs. One girl told me that she didn't know exactly what he did, but her grandfather was involved in the Nagasaki mission, too. Her family has all these photographs that he took that no one had ever seen before of the mushroom cloud over Nagasaki. He must have been on one of the survey planes. Another girl told me that my grandfather saved her grandfather's life. Her grandfather wasn't on his way to Japan. He was already on Japan, mainland, and he was scheduled to go into battle on August 7th. The bomb was dropped on August 6th, and the battle was canceled, and he lived. And she knew that she lived, too, because of it. I don't know how many lives were saved because of the dropping of the atomic bomb, or if there were any at all, but she knows that her life was spared. This is what she said. And so she feels conflicted. The next year, Sadako's nephew, Yuji, brought me and the grandson of President Truman, Clifton Daniel, to Japan. Clifton, Clifton was the first Truman family member to come to Japan, and it was a huge deal for him to be here. I got to be in the background of this historic visit. I got to witness and see all of the meetings and be in the press conferences, but it wasn't about me. I kind of felt like Forrest Gump, <laughs> you know, just in the background. But we met a total of 15, I think, survivors. Maybe he met more. And they told us their story, and they asked us to remember their stories and to tell them to the world. I'm not coming here today to argue the decision of the atomic bomber defend what happened. I just don't want you to forget what happened. The day that we forget what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki is the day we risk it happening again. Survivors told us what it was like for them. On August 6th, it was a clear blue sky and a hot sunny day. They knew something was coming. Hiroshima hadn't been bombed yet like the other Japanese cities. And they had narrow streets. They were tearing down the houses to make them wider to be escape routes. They were using 13-year-olds, up to adults. Everybody was working to make these routes wider. But nobody could imagine what was coming. At 15, people were setting out for their day, just getting to work, getting onto the streetcar, getting off of the streetcar sitting in class and looking out the window. And they saw a silver plane, a B-29 bomber, and they said it looked beautiful. And they pointed up at it, and then some people said it flew in another direction, and some people said they swear they saw a black dot fall through the sky, the parachutes dropping what turned out to be measuring equipment. And some people didn't see anything. They just saw a flash. And when they woke up, no one remembered how long they were knocked out for, but Hiroshima was gone. It was a sea of fire, death, destruction. 
The roads were full of dead bodies and dying people, their skin hanging off. They were holding their arms like this to avoid the pain. The river, the rivers, Hiroshima has a lot of rivers, and they were all full of dead bodies. You couldn't even see the water, but people were drinking from it anyway because they needed the relief. An eight-year-old girl, she was eight at the time, someone came up to her begging for water. She gave it to them. He was bloodied. She, he died right in front of her. The, the father told her that night, don't give water to the burn victims, and so she lied and said she didn't. So for 30 years, she said she kept it secret. She wasn't burned by the atomic bombs, but she carries what she calls invisible scars. A year later, I got to meet the family of Tsutomu Yamaguchi. He's the double survivor, they call him. He was working in Hiroshima. He was a ship designer, and he was scheduled to go home on August 7th, but the bomb dropped on August 6th. He barely escaped with his life. He was severely burned. He made it home to Nagasaki, bandaged and injured. He went to work on August 9th, and he told his coworkers what happened. Nobody believed him. How could one bomb destroy an entire city? He was a technician. He should know better, they said. And that's when the second bomb went off. And he thought the mushroom clouds were following him. His family could have had a million different responses to meeting me. And his daughter actually told me that when my grandfather came to Japan in 1985, he angered a lot of the hibakusha. He didn't apologize for what he helped do. Didn't feel any regret. But he came to meet survivors. And he came to plead to the world that we learn how to get along because he knew that we could destroy everything. However, his daughter said, we didn't bring you here to yell at you. We don't want an apology anymore. My father taught me how to be above that. We have to come together. We have to work together for peace. It's our duty. Stoma Yamaguchi used to say, we are living in a world where we're listening to the loudest and the most radical people. And we think that they're right. World War II was the same way. We have to listen to our hearts. We know what's right, even if it doesn't sound like that anyone else agrees. You know what is right. And the truth can start out as a whisper, but we must keep telling it. The truth can transcend borders. If we can imagine a world without war and a world without nuclear weapons, then we can work together and achieve it. Thank you.